Welcome to this episode of Creative Mind. I'm your host, Bobby Brill, and in this episode, I talk with Julie Downing, a prolific children's book illustrator and author. In our talk, Julie takes us through her decision to go to art school, her path to children's books, and her life, and I mean her lifetime as an artist. And she's one of those rare people that you get to meet who's got it all figured out on what it means to be an artist. And her story and her tips are great. You can check out Julie's work by going to your local bookstore or library, and of course, by visiting her website at juliedowning.com. And it's also important to let you know that she teaches a class in children's book illustration here at the Academy of Art University as well. So if you've ever picked up a children's book and said, I think I can do better than that. Well, this is your chance to get the tips to take the right steps. And at the end, we didn't really go in depth on it, but Julie also spends her time working with an organization called RoomToRead.org. And this is a great organization that is working hard at spreading literacy to underprivileged areas. So check them out as well. And before we officially start, if you like this episode and want to hear more, please hit that subscribe button on whatever podcast player you're listening to us in. So now here's our talk with Julie Downing. To kind of lead off, tell me how long have you been an illustrator and was that your original artistic path? You know, I've actually been an illustrator really almost since I graduated from college. It was a surprise to me that I went to art school. I actually thought I was going to either be an actress or um, I might have been somebody that I love to read, so I thought maybe English. And then when I was a senior in high school, I had a guidance counselor who told me that the biggest waste of time was to think about going to art school. And I was like, really? Okay, then I think I'll go to art school. So, what, did he um, give you any reason well, behind that? He basically that? said when most people, you'll never make a living doing it. You probably should take a typing class then because then you could you know, learn to type and support yourself. And why go to college for that? It's just a waste of time. And, you know, it really pissed me off, frankly. So I thought, well, I'm going to look into art schools. I hadn't really thought of that. I did a little bit of art in high mm -hmm. school, but I was not that kid who was constantly drawing or constantly the best artist in the class. I liked it. I loved art. But I would say I was, I was more into theater, and I actually was a much bigger reader. So I loved stories. That was really what it was all about for me. And um, so I really have to credit my guidance counselor for saying that to me because I might have gone to a more traditional college and done art, which maybe would have led me to where I ended up. But I ended up choosing the Rhode Island School of Design because I looked for the hardest art school to get into. <laughs> I did think, well, I'm going to apply to the hardest one. And then if I don't get in, I guess that's the way it goes. And so I applied. And I got in, and I thought, oh, my God, I have to accept oh, no. before they realize, like, who is that Julie Downing? I don't think we really admitted her. So I immediately accepted and ended up at RISD for four years. And, um, and it was there that I took a class in children's book illustration. And I just felt like that combined everything I love to do um, because it combines reading it combines storytelling. It also is a little bit, I think of it as being a little bit of a movie director. Mm -hmm. You're sort of in charge of all the visuals. All that decision making is yours. And there's, and there, and I hear from a lot of, uh, when people talk about children's books, that there's a, it's a, it's a formula. It's like a finite number of pages, right? Yes. Yeah. It pretty much splits down to, it's a 32 page book or a 40 page book. And so within that, I consider it an empty stage. And so then I'm in charge of whatever goes on that stage for 40 pages or 32 pages. So ever since I probably was a sophomore at RISD, I really haven't wanted to do any other type of illustration. I did a tiny bit of advertising, um, and that drove me crazy, oh, mostly because um, I felt like they were all over me all the time, and it wasn't about what I wanted to do. It was about what they wanted me to do. And I couldn't get over the number of changes. They'd be like, we want you to move the dog's head like one sixteenth of an inch. I'm like, really? Why? And, and by the way, you have an hour to do it. 
So I was like, oh, this is just not for me. And one of the things I do love about kids' books is the, the deadline is long. I would say on average, it's six months. So I have six months to complete, you know, 16 spreads and a, and a cover. I actually don't talk to the art director very often in between, and I, I actually like that. I feel like it's, you know, they sort of put it all in my lap. They're like, here, here's the story. Um, now you you go do your do what you do. And it's really up to me to make all the visual choices. I, I think you just sold me on children's book illustration. I have to go back now. Yeah. And take, you know, six months of time to do it and nobody telling me what to do. And I get to do what I want. I, I mean, That's I should insane. pull back a little bit. Well, they I mean, do come to, in and tell you what, but sure. you actually have very, I feel like compared to what I did when I did advertising, there's actually not a lot of... Um, there isn't a lot of people telling you what to do because I think one of the things with art directors and editors, if they're good, they're hiring you for your sensibilities. So the way you think about a story, the way you're going to approach the story. And so the best editors that I work with are really hands off. It's more of a discussion. He'll say, why did you do that? And I'll say, I did that because this is what I was thinking. And he can say to me, you know, it doesn't work. I don't get it. Doesn't work. Or he can be like, okay, all right. Can you convince me that that's what you should be doing? As long as there's a reason behind it, I think they're fine to let you do what you want to do. And in terms of the six months, the thing I always tell my students is that sounds like an endless amount of sure. time. It goes so fast. And if you are not good managing your time, that six months, you'll come and a month will be there and you'll be like, oh, no, I have to do all this in a month. So I've actually gotten really good at, I'm, I do manage my time pretty well. Are you doing like now and even, and when you started, how many books do you think you You know, I pretty much, um, especially with my teaching schedule, I do about two books a year, oh, probably. Wow. Um, sometimes one and a half depends on the complexity of the book, but I try and do, um, about two a year. And I think um, I'm not a particularly fast illustrator, so I'm not, you know, sometimes I'll do two books plus some smaller projects. I might do a book cover. I might do some textbook work. I might do, you know, a smaller, simpler book. Um, but pretty much for the big trade picture books, I really don't do more than two a year. Still, that's still a nice... Nice yeah. career yeah. path and, yeah. and career goal. Yeah, yeah, six months does go by fast, but man, anything. Anytime anybody tells me I have six months to do anything, yeah. it's like, Well, it is oh nice to be, to have that amount of time, you know, to really have that freedom to sort of plan your time and how you, how you organize your time and what you need. Because I find each book is different. So sometimes you need more time at the front end. You know, you have to do a lot of research. I just finished a book that was a biography, and there was much more time at the front end, researching, photographing, gathering information, visual information. So that took a long time. And so I, I needed a little less time to do the finishes. So I, I think you get to organize how it all works out. Well, then walk, walk, walk us through the process then of the book you've done, Lotus and Feathers. So what's the process, if you, as much as you can tell us, the, okay. the process in building out that world? Generally speaking, what does surprise people a little bit is there's, there's very little contact with the author. Really? So I am not contacted by the author. Um, the author has already sold the story to a publisher. And then it's really the publisher's job to match author and illustrator. And so I am approached from the publisher. So in this case, it was Disney, Hyperion. Um, and they asked me to do the book. So they just send me the story. I don't want illustration notes. I don't want them to divide the text up. All I want is the story. So the very first thing I do is really just r read it, make notes, think about kind of what the overall point of the story is. What am I trying to get across with my art? What's the author want to say? And then I, I divide the text up, and it helps me see whether I'm going to make the book a 40-page book, a 32-page book, a 48-page book. I do have a little bit of flexibility with the length. Sometimes the publisher will say, eh, no, sorry, 
It's a 32-page book. Yeah, that's kind of the industry standard, 32. Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's in groups of eight, basically. Yeah. It's how they print it. So, But 32 is kind of a standard, but I can expand it a little bit. So I spend a lot of time dividing up the text and kind of giving myself a framework for the illustrations. Yeah. And then the next thing I do, um, lots and lots of research, um, gathering uh, things about the environment, things about the character, costumes, um, setting, birds. And I do all sorts of different types of research. I would have loved to have gone to China for this. I wish I could have. I just, I didn't have time to fit that in. Sometimes it does work out and I can do that. But it, you know, even with a six month deadline, you have to really keep up on stuff. And the process didn't allow me to do that. But I know a lot of people that have been to China you know, with YouTube and all of those things. I watched a gazillion YouTube videos. <laughs> I watch a lot of movies that take place in China. I, of course, look on Google Images, but I kind of try and expand my my thinking beyond Google Images. So I went to a crane sanctuary um, so that I could actually photograph real cranes and draw real cranes. My husband did go to China, and I sent him also to a crane sanctuary. Right, you I know you have homework. other things to do, but could you just like get me some photos birds, of the birds crane? Birds, while you're there, birds. birds. Yeah, so I do that, and then also just a lot of research into what people wear. So I gather all that research, and then I do thumbnails. And so then I'm laying out the book in terms of small thumbnails, and then I sort of work bigger and bigger and more detailed from there. And what the publisher sees, which is probably about six weeks to two months into the process, I send them a set of full-size sketches, just okay. black and white sketches, and we work from there. When you're doing research, and if you've had no notes from the uh, original writer, and it's really, it's your world building at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you're determining the time, the, the place and time and the setting and and in this case, the weather, was the weather part of the story? You know, there was a um, tsunami that happened in the story because it was loosely based on an actual event. That wasn't so much me. That was the author, and I had to kind of incorporate that in. But also think about, I mean, one of the things you have to think about is you can't have all the art be like, sunny day, sunny day, oh, tsunami, and then, you know, so you're thinking about how you incorporate what the author tells you and then what you bring to it in terms of building this visual world. Is there a sweet spot for you as far as um, the place and time, the time period? Because I, I know I remember looking at the book and there, there's a winter yeah. pro pro progression. Yes. Because that, you know, that then you got to... Well, that I really, uh, you know, I was the one that decided sort of the weather. I mean, I kind of knew there's a little bit of clue from the author and what she says in the text. I use the weather in that book for an emotional uh, journey. Okay. So it starts in the winter because she can't talk, and it really was meant to end in the fall where, uh, you know, it was a much more upbeat time. Okay. So that was my decision. Okay. And just visually, it gave me a great um, color story. Okay. And and that that does make sense as, as you're explaining it. You know, we could, you were saying sunny day, sunny day, sunny day. Well, that gets boring right. very quickly. I actually laid out a calendar with my thumbnails, and I would say, this takes place in November. This scene is December, December, January. And then I knew that there was a part that was the Chinese New Year. So this scene has to happen in February. And actually, it kind of naturally laid out to, all, to go through a year. It actually went through a year. So you really are making a film. Yeah, this, this, is is. this is storyboarding. It, I'm totally storyboarding <laughs> like, a, like somebody who makes a film. That's, I think, the biggest thing with being a children's book illustrator. You're not thinking about one illustration. You're actually thinking about a sequence or sequential art. And it really is like a mini movie. I knew it was based on an actual event, and I did tons of research trying to find, like, because China's a big country. So where exactly in China did this take place? Right. Like, can I get research of, you know, where it was and where her village was so that I could at least have correct buildings? Um, and the author was a little bit unspecific. I mean, sometimes I can, either through the publisher or directly with the author, I might write and say, by the way, d you know, did you set it in a specific place? Because if you didn't, then I'm going to set it in a specific sure. place. Sure, if we were, if you were drawing cowboys and the time yeah. period was wrong and right, you know, right. Texas versus Oklahoma and versus Colorado. I sort of Colorado. knew the time period wasn't really 
contemporary, but it also wasn't a long time ago. So we were talking about relatively modern day. And so looking at clothing from, from you know, what Chinese kids are wearing today. Yeah, that, 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 as you're saying that, I'm going, that's got to be the hardest thing to think of. It's nonspecific. It's not ultra modern, but it's not ancient. Right. But it's contemporary. Right. So, so. <laughs> what do you do? Well, I find that, you know, with, with doing kids' books, a lot of it is you, like, narrowing your parameters. So you deciding, like, where is it going to be set? It's going to take place in a year. How old is the character? Uh, all of those kinds of things. It's all about me giving myself less options. I think it's like a puzzle. And you're trying to like fit all the pieces together and make them all make sense. And I do find it is a little bit about narrowing your possibilities so that you can make decisions that make sense that serve the book. And one of the things I tell my students, you know, when they start a project, and this is one of the things I do at the very beginning, I said, the very first thing you should do is read the story, read the story, read the story, and then write for yourself, what's this story about? Not necessarily like the synopsis, but really like, what's the heart of the story? Is the emotional about? beats. Right. Yes, yes. You know. So is it friendship? Is it, you know, and just write that on a piece of paper and stick it above your desk. And then every time you come to a decision point, you have to go back to, uh, is what I'm doing making sense with, uh, with what I decided the story is about? And so that helps you make those choices. Oh, wow. That's, that's a very unique way of looking at your design and illustration yeah. process. And when you talk about, you know, kids' books seem so simple, but they're not usually simple. But if you're good at it, you make it look simple. And some of it is really understanding what that story is about and having every decision you make serve what the story is about. We're going to come back to that because I'm going to ask you about kids' books because I okay. got a little kid and a lot of people do. And if anybody's into art or has gone to art school or is even thinking about art, the first thing they do see when they look at kids' yeah. books, they're like, I could have done that. <laughs> but we're going to come back to that because okay. I want to finish the process. Okay. So after you've done your research and you've gotten through your thumbnails uh, and you've gone into your, you call it your first draft or your... Yeah, your... I would say that I send my publisher kind of a first draft, usually full-size black and white sketches with value. And then that's where their comments come in. And so then that's the first time I really hear from them. And they also send it to the author, but then they compile the author's comments in with theirs. And so that's the first chance I get to see about what they think. And then we, I usually get, you know, pages and pages of a long letter. It just wants me to like, ah! Every, um, everything you did was great. Now do the opposite. Yeah. And there's lots and lots of revision. Again, I tell my students half this process is revision, taking what you did and pushing it further. Um, and it's never right the first time. Uh, then I get back a lot of comments and I usually revise. Sometimes it's a lot of comments, sometimes not so many. And then I revise, I do another set of sketches. I like to, but not everybody does this. I usually do a color storyboard because it, the color to me Again, it's not just about a single image. It's really overall getting the color to work throughout the whole book. And I thought it was so interesting. I went to Pixar, and they often put their color um, storyboards on the wall. And it's like, this is exactly what I do. Make an overall color storyboard like this and get that emotional arc with color. Yeah, that is so funny. I remember being in school, and I think a lot of us who were not necessarily the fine art or the illustration, who were just taking basic art stuff. And that that time you take your first color theory class, yeah. everything you ever thought totally changes. Yeah. It really opens your mind a lot when somebody teaches you color and why and how and yeah. what these colors mean. It's a whole storytelling device that you can that you have in your toolbox that you need to use. And so I think a lot about color. Um, and so I usually will send uh, the publisher my color storyboard or at least give them an indication of what the color is going to be, the overall palette. Um, sometimes I'll try and finish one illustration and send it to them so they're not, I don't want them at the end of this long process to be like, holy cow, is that what she did? Um, so I try and give them a sort of a heads up about what I'm doing. And then I, um, I might get some more um, comments from them. And then I'm pretty much left alone again to finish the art. And that takes me anywhere from two months to four months 
to do the art for the book. And your artwork, are you focusing on traditional like pen and pencil or are you drawing digitally? I or? used to be a very traditional watercolor painter. And I would say three quarters of my book are done with just traditional watercolors. Actually, Lotus and Feather was the first time I did this. I was getting a little frustrated with the watercolor. I felt like, first of all, more and more changes were happening. I think as more artists work digitally, art directors are used to saying, you know, we don't really like that face. Can you change that face? And if you're doing traditional watercolor, you're just like, not not really. No. Um, <laughs> no, I can't. Or you, you know, it's forever to do that and it takes forever. And there were other things I was just frustrated about. And so I really started playing around in Lotus and Feather with working 100% traditionally but combining everything digitally. So I would sort of break it up into pieces. So the background is one piece of art. The characters are another piece of Uh, art. You know, each little element I would draw separately, and then I would scan them all, and then I could combine them all into a single illustration using Photoshop. And I found it, for me, and kind of the way I think, such a much better way to work. And so um, that's pretty much how I'm working all the time now. So it's all 100% traditionally done with watercolor pencil. So there's not much digital. I do a little tweaking digitally. But it's all combined digitally. Okay, almost like you're mastering it digitally. So yeah, it's really an interesting technique, and it gives me tons and tons of flexibility. So once you are delivering your, your final pieces to the publisher, what's that next step for you, or is that pretty much it? You know, I do have to do sort of separately a cover, um, but that's, and then sometimes I will tweak and have to make changes to the final art. Um, most of the time, I will send it in, and then they have a committee that they they check for things like consistency, you know, is is the king wearing a crown in every illustration, all those kinds of things. So I might have to do some tweaks, but that's essentially it for me. I'm pretty much done, and then I move on quickly to the next project because <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually late. I'm like, okay, now I'm late on the next one. I got to move on. Because you, you're predominantly... In the world of children's books, you are all illustrators are pretty much freelance. Yeah, at this I am point. a freelance illustrator and I am paid project to project. Usually in kids' books, the way it works is that you're given an advance against royalties. And so you get half up front, half when you finish. And then if you sell a fair number of books, you make royalties in okay, between. Okay, so yeah. even children's books, illustrations still follow the, the book model of you're going to get paid eventually one day. Yeah. You hope. <laughs> sometimes it works out really well. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> but yeah. Um, talk, talk about that because I'm going to come back to uh, us talking about other kids' books. But I know the royalty part and the um, the business side of it is, uh-huh. is equally important. It um, is. How do you go about choosing a project? You know, I... I go a little bit with my heart because you spend an awful long time on these books and you have to think that if you're going to spend six months on a project, you better darn well love what you're drawing. Um, I try not, I try not to think too hard about, you know, being too practical because for instance, uh, at one point, I was offered from a big publisher to do a Raggedy Ann, um, a brand new Raggedy Ann book. And I was like, oh my God, my gravy train is here. Yes, I'm going to do this. This is fantastic. <laughs> Finally, Hawaii, here yeah. I come. And you know what? They never published the book. Oh, I no. set aside other projects. I like oh, killed no. myself to meet their deadline. And I remember this so well. I sent the art in and a day later they called me and they said, you know, we realize we've just flooded the market with Raggedy Ann stuff, so we're not going to publish your book. And I was like, really? You know, so I spent six months of my life, I put aside another really great project so I could meet your deadline. I mean, I got paid for it. I got paid my advance, but nothing else. What I realized is that the couple times I've kind of thought like, oh, this is going to be like a big moneymaker for me, it has never worked out. <laughs> so in the end, after you know 50 books or however many I've done, I just decide I'm going to spend time doing the things that I really like to do. And sometimes I take something that's a little different because I think oh, I'm bored with doing this. I want to challenge. Sure. Um, or sometimes what satisfies me as an artist um, because I find I do the most interesting things that way. Like what's something you really enjoy digging into? My strengths as an illustrator and an artist are color. 
Um, I think landscape. I think sequential storytelling. Um, and I really hate to draw mechanical things. Okay. So I try to hard, really hard to stay away from anything that would smack of mechanical anything. So no, no, no robot warriors, <laughs> yeah, no trucks. Yeah, no robot okay. warriors, okay. no okay. airplanes, no <laughs> spaceships, nothing like that. Well, yeah, it's funny you say that because I think that there's – that's something that um, – when you look at a lot of children's books from the illustrator standpoint, you're like, oh, I can draw that. And then you think about like, oh, I was never really good at drawing that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then you look also at a children's book and you're like, that seems exceedingly simple. What's what's happening here? Like, uh -huh. you know, we've, we, you know, the books that come to mind, you know, we've all seen Dr. Seuss books and they're exceedingly simple, but nobody can copy it. Because they're not so simple. They're not so simple. And they it, look simple, but your they're brain not doesn't, simple. Your brain doesn't work. Nobody's brain works that way. Right. And then you look at, um, you know, the wonderful world of Richard Scarry. And that is like, that's really high detail. And, you know, you can learn to do this, not taking away anything from it, but you can learn to get that detail. And you look at The Hungry Caterpillar, and it's a great book, but you look at the actual pieces of it, and you're like, I don't understand why this is so powerful because it seems so utterly simple. Yeah, I think that to me is what it's all about. When it seems utterly simple, it's not simple. It's not. And in fact, I think the more simple an artist can make it look, the more the more difficult it is. And I've seen some really wonderful videos of Eric Carl and I mean his art is not simple. Okay. And a lot of it is kind of what you choose to leave out, how much are you going to say. Um, I think it's deceptive. And it, I, so I teach a class at the Academy Children's Book too. And what makes me feel really good at the end of the class is my class will say to me, because they spend a whole semester on one project, so it's very much mirroring the real world. And at the end, they all say, oh, my God, I had no idea this was so hard. Be and even with simple books, because they realize the number of decisions and revision and choices that they have to make and think about to make a simple book seem simple. So, so talk to me about that simplicity, because again, with children's books, and I think anything that gets into the, you know, it, it, when people try to start putting a dollar amount on your work. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if you're if you're you know a student if you're going to pay help a student go to school or even when you're learning you're like I, how can something like Hello Kitty or <laughs> that doesn't count okay <laughs> so, well they good but there's also that that there's this whole genre of artwork that seems there's nothing to it right. and then we talked about Robert um, Eric Carlyle I'm sorry uh, Eric Carlyle um, his simplicity and then I also see books that are so simple that they just seem bad. Explain simple to me. Well, I'm trying to think of, you know, some examples, for instance, that I really love. Like Harold and the Purple Crayon. I don't know if you've okay. seen that. Like you look at those drawings and you think, R really? Right. Like how long did that take that guy? You know, and I think, oh, my God, I labor for a week over each finish. And what, did he dash that out in like five minutes? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think, again, when you think about it, it's not just about that final art you see in the book, but it's really about planning the whole visual story and sequence. So it's how did the page before work with the that page work with the page after? How does the overall sequence work? What kind of character are you creating? What's the, you know, is the character um, meaningful? Do you care about the character? That all comes into it. And then I think the actual final artwork, sometimes it is really simple. And I think that comes down to individual style. I mean, trust me, there are many times I think, do I have to paint this way? I can't do something simpler. It would be so much easier and faster and more um, lucrative. Right. Uh, but I also think as artists, we, we do what we do. And, um, you know, you have a certain artistic voice and that's sort of the way it comes out. It's hard when you look at books because, I mean, growing up, I mean, I'm 42, so there's books that, you know, some of us who were lucky enough to remember reading Rainbow and books like The Gorilla Did It, mm -hmm. um, where the wild things are these very, of a time period. You look at that time period, it, it, you know when they were done. Right. And we look at Dr. Seuss books um, and then everything in between in here, you're just kind of going, where is this book for the kid? Or is this book for the parent? Is it? Are we thinking about timelessness, or what do we? How 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 do those dis beyond the story? Is there? 
is there a decision that goes into it or is is a publisher coming to you and kind of going, well, let's go deep? Actually, the publisher probably, that's why they're choosing the illustrators. So they're kind of already determining, um, you know, how, how do we want this book to be approached? You know, so who can, who can do that? You know, who can develop really wonderful characters and also does excellent backgrounds and can really bring that out? Who are we going to pick for that? So I think they've, that's part of where the whole process of choosing an illustrator comes in. And so that by the time I get the project, I think my job is to bring what I do best and, you know, serve the story the best way I can. And so I'm mostly thinking about story. I'm sort of not going, will this be universal? Will this win an award? Will this sell a million copies? Because I think as an illustrator, you actually don't have a lot of control over that. And so I think what you're trying to do is really get in there and think, I just want to create the very best visual story that I can. What's the difference in the process for you uh, in illustrating versus writing the, 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 the uh, you words? Know, it's, it's, it, is different in each book. I mean, I consider myself an illustrator first and a writer second, so that often when I do a book, it comes to me as pictures first. Um, and again, it just depends on um, how simple or complex the, the book is. So I've written a biography of Mozart, for example. That was much more complicated, and the story came first, because I couldn't really do the art without the story. I've done some simpler books where really it was more of a concept that I came up with, and um, I had the art sort of figured out, and then I could plug text in because it was very simple text. Okay. Um, the next book after the one I'm finishing, Friday, um, I wrote, and it's so seemingly simple, and it took me, I bet, five years to write really? that stupid book. <laughs> um, it's not stupid. But it just took a long time for sure. me to sort of come up with what's the point of the book, what am I trying to say with this book. I had pictures in mind, but I really needed to get the, the book written before I could um, do it. So it's almost like wearing two completely separate hats. I mean, the nice thing is, if, is, as the author, if I feel like, oh, this doesn't really work very well picture-wise, then I can go in and say, well, like, well, okay, I'm going to switch it then. If this doesn't work art-wise, then I can change the text. Um, and that's the beauty of being both. Do you, do you have a preference going forward now to do more writing? Or? I do want to do more writing. I just think it gives you a lot of control over, over what you do and also getting to do the subjects that you like to do. But I also really like doing other people's because it pushes me probably to do subject matter I wouldn't necessarily choose. We talked about, you know, you, you like to focus on color and landscape. Is there, a, is there a subject matter that you're thinking about more and more going forward that you haven't done in the past? Mm, well, I can tell you my next two books all take place at night. So I don't know what that oh, says. Okay. Color and light, I guess. <laughs> Shadow. Um, I also like drawing people. Um, so I am sort of character driven and I like that. I like relationships between people. So those kinds of books interest me. Um, but right now I'm just exploring, um, you know, what happens at night. So I have a book, of, the next book I'm doing is about a forest at night. The one after that is what happens in a city at night. And then beyond that, I don't know. So if I'm an illustration student and I'm venturing, want to venture into the world of children's books, how do I even begin the process? You know, I think the important thing if you're interested in being a children's book illustrator is you do have to have some sense of kids, which seems sort of silly, but I think there are a lot of students that get into it and, you know, they want to do actually much more mature things, you know, sort of creepy, graphic, slightly gory things. Great for teenagers. You can't do children's picture books with that. At the same time, I, it really drives me crazy when people say, I don't like to draw like cute little animals, so I wouldn't be a good children's book illustrator. It's like nothing says you have to draw cute animals. Sure. You right. can, but you don't have to. And there are some pretty incredible children's books out there. Yeah, we, we had talked, you know, there's Grizz Grimley. And yeah, then I mean, the, think about the, Grizz Grimley. His stuff is wonderful and kids love it. Some of it is knowing about age appropriateness. The other thing I think you have to do is you have to be kind of a natural storyteller and so you, you do have to think in terms of how you can tell a story visually. 
And so, for instance, I have a lot of students that come into my class, and I mean, they are knockout, incredible draftsmen, can draw a figure, can draw a portrait. I mean, it's incredible. But sometimes when they go to, to actually tell a story, they don't know what to do because they're used to having a model in front of them. Right. They draw the portrait, looks great, they're incredible draftsmen, but then what? So it's all about being able to bring life to your characters and really get in and tell a visual story. So I think often you don't have to be the very best draftsman in your figure drawing class. It's more about can you tell a story? Give me some tips on that because that's the hard – I mean for photographers, for, for filmmakers, I mean playwrights, you know, telling that story is that – that's the hurdle. You know, I think the thing I tell my students again is, you know, you have to dig deep into this and really think about when you're composing an illustration. I say think about those – I think they're five W's. It's like who's it about? Where does it take place? When does it take place? What's going on? And I said, the most important story element is why. Why is this happening? And I said, if you can work those out, ask yourselves those questions, and make that illustration work, you're telling a story. So it's really getting in there and, and thinking about what's going on here? Why is it happening? And how can I visually show that? And bring up emotion. I think emotion is storytelling. And, then, and, and on the technical side, it's got to be those transitional ideas, the, yeah. how you push the story forward that yeah. seems to be the most difficult, because yeah. that's oftentimes not the most exciting to draw, I'm guessing? Um, I think you different. have to then figure out if it's not the most exciting to draw, then what is exciting to draw, and really being able to decide what part of the story can I tell here. And again, it goes down to you're never doing a single image. So if you have a long text, say Lotus and Feather, which was a really long text, which is partly why I designed the book the way I did, because it was a really long text. Um, but every time I would, I would look at the text on a page, I would think, what part of this am I going to illustrate? What part am I choosing to draw? Why am I choosing to draw that? What does it say about what's going on? What part of the story am I bringing up? What's important here? And so I think that you're always thinking about how can I move this story forward um, and also actually bring some emotion and narrative to what's going on. So once, once a student's mastered that in one class, of course. <laughs> yes, in, in one semester. <laughs> one semester. Children's done, book one. <laughs> ready to go. I've got my book. I'm set. Yeah. Give me some money. Um, is going about getting work as a children's book illustrator different than, say, different than different from uh, being a uh, more traditional advertising you illustrator? You know, probably not. I mean, most children's book illustrators are dependent on an agent. So a lot of my students end up getting agents. I mean, that seems to be the way into a publisher these days, is having an agent who can take your work around, find projects, find people that you want to work with. Um, and I think that's pretty similar to either editorial or advertising. It's it's um, per project, and it's you probably need an agent to get into it. Okay. And then it's and then it's freelance right. again. Still mostly freelance. freelance. So then, what what are some of those good tips other than you'd mentioned time management um, and time management, and and then a little bit more time management. Um, other than time management, what are some tips or some things that illustration students need to think about as they're beginning their career? You know, one of the things I tell students is I think perseverance is a huge quality that you need. I've seen a lot of students, you know, they're all enthused when they get out and they like do one postcard mailing or they contact one agent and then they're like, oh, I never heard back. And it's like, oh, please, this is like, you're in this for the long term. So I think perseverance is important and the ability to, to listen and decide with if people are saying things about your work, what do you take seriously? And it's just constantly, again, move forward any way you can. So when I started out, I did take my portfolio around a lot um, and I got a variety of both good and bad comments. Everybody wasn't like, I love your work, here's a project. Some people would say, you know, your figures are a little stiff, or I'm not getting enough story here, or, and I would take it, I would take my portfolio back every time I met an art director, and I would make notes about what they said, and then I would think about, are they right? Is that their personal opinion? Or are they actually right? And if they were right, I would redo a piece, or I'd do another piece. 
or I I would feel like if people have seen the same work, um, okay, I've got to do something new. And that continues to be true, you know, 40 years later or however long I've been doing this, is that I constantly have to be doing new work. That's interesting because that's, that's something a lot of people forget or never want to come to terms with right. that your style would you say changes or your yeah, I think my style changes I think it changes with each book it also changes as a natural progression of being an artist um, you know you want new challenges you don't want to be bored you want to try something new um, so I think if you're going to be in this kind of career long term you somehow have to have the enthusiasm to really get in there and think you're never satisfied with what you do. That to me is the biggest thing that you need, whether you're just out of art school, you're an art school student, you're not satisfied, so you wanna think, okay, that was not bad, I did the best I could at the time, but what can I do better? And what am I gonna do better next time? Because I think at the end of every book, that's pretty much what I say to myself, aside from like, oh, thank God that's all over. I'm gonna have a drink now. And, um, <laughs> well, there, yeah, there's a great quote when it comes to, uh, anybody that's ever worked in film or video, it's like, projects are never finished, they're merely abandoned. Yes, <laughs> that's very true. And so usually when I, you know, it used to be I'd take this big package to the post office and it was so satisfying to mm -hmm. walk away. Now I like hit send and then <laughs> I'm like, oh, I could work on that a little bit more and send it to them again. Um, but yes, so you finish and then I always a few days later think, okay, I finished that, but what for the next project am I going to do better or different or what didn't work so well or what am I trying to do the next time? And I think that's kind of what propels you forward. Oh, that's, that's interesting because you don't hear that a lot in the beginning of your journey. Right. It, that, you know, you, that, yeah, your style is going to change. You're going to like, no, one, no longer want to do that thing anymore and want to do this. And Yeah, I think one of the qualities I think that makes a successful student and probably a successful illustrator is that ability to um, push yourself forward. And not think, I think a lot of students feel pressure like, I've got to get through art school and I've got to have my style figured out and then that's it. I'm done. I'm never going to change my style. I'm just going to get work and we're good to go. And, you know, as someone who's been in the career for a long time, I find that is not true. And in fact, um, if you do that, I think you're going to run out of work. When I go to your website and I see your, your, your volume of work, if I never, if I took your name off everything, it's like, oh, this is... This is a shelf in a bookstore. Yeah. This is not a portfolio of an artist. Right. And that seems so difficult to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, good for you. But again, <laughs> you know, it's, it's over a long term, and some of it is changing styles and, and changing the way I work. But um, I do think that's one of the things that keeps you long term. Is there ever a point where you're just like, I just don't want to do stippling anymore. Because there, there did seem to be that period where everything was this kind of stippled, dotty, matrixy style. You know, I think kids' books are like anything. There, There's fashion. Some things okay. go in okay. and out of style. Um, and, you know, do I ever get to a point? Yeah, sometimes. I guess, and I think that's what propelled me to get away from traditional watercolors, is I just felt like at a certain point, it felt like it was more limiting than anything else. So I thought, okay, I just feel like I'm so limited here. It's making it harder to do what I do. So what am I going to do to shift this around and try something different so that I go back to enjoying what I'm doing? You know, it started to feel like, oh my God, if I have to do one more of these washes. And, um, and so I thought, okay, that's not a way to be. I'm, you know, I can't, I can't work like that. So what's going to make this more enjoyable for me? Is there a specific bag of tricks or a specific set of tools that really apply to children's books? Because a lot of children's book stuff seems to be watercolor seems to be a thing that is If prevalent. anything, I would say, you know, because a lot of students do ask me this, should I work digitally? You know, should I work traditionally? And I would say, no, there isn't a certain bag of tricks. I think what editors and art directors look for is they want to see the voice of the artist. They really want to see what you individually bring to that. And so if that means you work digitally and you're really good at it, do that. If you're really good at traditional watercolor, do that. Um, 
but don't do it because you think that's what somebody's looking for okay. particularly. So no, I don't think there is a bag of tricks, okay. really. I would say no. Okay. And in fact, I encourage my students, like, be as individual as you can. That's the one thing I think people really want to look for individual voices. So be unique, be individual, and be competent at what you do. Every time I pick one up, I get very cynical and, and very artsy-fartsy, like, all right, this better be a good kid's book. Yeah. Well, I'm not buying this kid's book unless it's I really I read my cool. kids a lot of really bad children's books, too. <laughs> I'm like, really? This, this got sold? Oh, my God. <laughs> How? I, you know, How did I, that happen? I, as, as soon as we had our, our kid, the first thing I went, I was like, I go, okay, I need Walk It In My Pocket, <laughs> and I need Hop On Pop, and I need yeah. Green Eggs and Ham. So we talked about, you know, first day after you graduate, first day after working, because being an artist is also about, you know, eating and living and right. paying oh, your bills. Yes, yes and it having, is. And having a roof over your head. Uh-huh. Um, if money was no object, what would be a project you would really like to work I on? I just love that question because you know what? If money were no object, I'd do exactly <laughs> what I'm doing now. No, come on. <laughs> no, really. No. I would. Really? I totally would. Really? Yeah, because I tend not to take the projects. I mean, occasionally I will take a project for money. Maybe it's my age, too. If I were like 25, I'd take a project for money. <laughs> I would. Um, but, you know, now I've done it enough that I feel like those are the worst projects to take. Right. I have never had one of those projects work out. <laughs> and so I'm at the point now where I'm like, I'm not going to take a project just for money. I am going to take a project because I like it. And it's really great if it pays a lot of money. Like that, to me, is great. But yeah, somebody else said that to me. They said, you know, are you, like, say you're going to retire. What are you going to do? I'm like, let me think. I'm going to teach at the Academy of Art because I love teaching and I love the students. And I'm going to write and illustrate kids' books and travel. Because I have this other, like, kind of separate life that goes along with kids' books. That's the one thing when you illustrate children's books. I think sometimes you can do other things that all make it work out. So... I also travel a lot and um, teach in foreign places. Um, I work for a great organization called Room to Read that goes into um, underdeveloped countries and trains local illustrators how to oh, illustrate wow. their own books. So I get great travel. I get to meet incredible people and work in some really interesting places. So I do that in the summer when I'm not teaching at the academy. So you get to teach, which means you get to do art, and you have a yeah. career getting art, doing art, and yeah. then you work with organizations doing art. Yes. Yeah, you really are a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so see yeah. when people say, like, what would you really do? Like, pretty yeah. much what I'm doing now. <sighs> I hate to say it. That's I hate oh. to say oh, it. Oh, that hurts my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I do think, like, in terms of, like, dream projects, well, that I, I would, as I said, I'd love to write more. Um, but I am starting to do that more. So those would be my kind of dream projects. You know, I like being in charge of all that. <laughs> it's probably why I like teaching. <laughs> I like being in charge. So that was our talk with Julie Downing. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to start looking harder at children's books the next time I see one. 32 pages seems easy enough to do, right? I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Creative Mind. And if you like what you're listening to so far, please tell a friend and hit subscribe so you don't miss another interview or any of our bonus episodes. And next month, we're going to focus on video game design, UX and UI for games, and even a bit of animation. So all of the building blocks to the trillion dollar industry that is video games. As more and more art and design career opportunities arise, employers are on the hunt for the next generation of talented and skilled creative professionals. At Academy of Art University, you will get the work-ready skills that employers want. You can study on-site in downtown San Francisco or anywhere in the world with our online programs. To request info about our more than 40 areas of study in art and design, including game development, fashion design, photography, UX design, and more, just visit our website at academyart.edu slash creativemind.